Unknown Thought is made possible through the generosity of sponsors who care about people. IC Savings Bank, Ready Honda, and Corey's Clothing. On Unknown Thought, another opportunity to talk to Howard Edelman, usually seen on Israel and the Jewish world. Howard, I'm delighted to have a personal behind the scenes interview with you. Howard, let me, this is all that's left in my beard. Why didn't you have a bar mitzvah? You're disclosing all my secrets. Sorry, it's <laughs> the only one I know. <laughs> uh, it's on several levels. One, I was a rebel and argued that people, all the kids around me were having bar mitzvahs just for the money they could get out of it. And I thought that was sacrilegious. Uh, I think it's because my father and mother had split up just the year before. That was a factor. I think it was that I was a rebel anyway. Uh, and I took religious seriously, I, you know, which a lot of people didn't, um, and thought that the rote kind of learning we were doing was, I despised it and rebelled against it. So it was a combination of levels, personal, social, uh, intellectual, and uh, uh, there's a fourth factor is I can't read. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> people think, I, you know, I read so many books, I must be able to read, but in fact, I. I've never been able to read a text in public. Really? No, I give a lecture, I write a whole lecture out, and I never read it. I give it, give a talk. But I can't, when I have to read a text, I have terrible difficulties. It's funny, because I'm thinking that when Moses came down and he broke the Ten Commandments, he must have just read what he heard, and then God repeated it, but he never read it off the text. Mm. So what happened to you after that? You, you're, you have all these you know, all these reasons for war, and you don't have your bar mitzvah. And what happens to you? Well, I become a, a sort of social, uh, not during high school, but by the time I get to university, I'm a social activist, get involved in the peace movement, become a leader of the campaign, can a, a combined universities campaign for nuclear disarmament, organize co-ops, uh, you know, do a number of things, uh, as well as pursuing my PhD. Um, I'm married young, I have children, um, so I'm pursuing a full life um, and finding uh, it was the Six Day War, for example, that was very critical for me because uh, when the Six Day War came, I was supposedly a cosmopolitan citizen, uh, like a lot of young people become, they identify with the world, etc., and found that I was fearful of Israel being wiped out at the time. Mm -hmm. And the fear was tremendous. And I said, this is kind of, if I'm a cosmopolitan citizen, why do I care more about Israel than anything else? Which I did. Uh, and uh, I didn't answer the question because the war went fast, the victory came fast. But it now became a big question mark in my mind. And I determined to go to Israel, which I did in 73, uh, before the war in 73. Took my family. We had been. Uh, month in Africa, it was my sabbatical year. And then I went on to Israel. I argued it was on the way home, was my rationale. And the kids all loved Israel. They thought it was even more tremendous than seeing three million animals on the uh, Serengeti Plains. Uh, everybody's excited, and I went back uh, for another sabbatical to teach at the Hebrew University as a lady, Davis visiting professor. and fell in love with the country, frankly, uh, quite separate from anything else. But I found being in Israel was like being nowhere in anywhere else in the world for me. And it enriched my life and has enriched my life ever since and become central to my sense of self as a Jew. Um, and I, you know, I never dissociated from being a Jew, uh, but it became, it, instead of being a Jew, I'm a Jew, but I'm really a rebel and a radical that kind of thing, I became a Jew, period, uh, and uh, saw Israel as very central to my life. And where's, what role does religion play for you in your life at this point? Um, very important role, but not institutional religion, um, as it is for many other people. It's very hard, as every Jew finds, to find a Jew. Every Jew needs his own synagogue. <laughs> and that's why they're forced to find, form into minions. <laughs> Uh, 
because everybody's so independent. And so you have this kind of uncomfortable uh, fit between yourself and an institutional setting, which everyone has. It's not me in any unique way. Uh, but I find I'm always reading about it and discussing primarily with one of my ch children who's, who, who's an expert in, uh, in medieval Jewish thought. And she keeps sending me her writings, and we have discussions on Torah parshas. And she gives me her interpretation of, pas uh, you know, of sections, and I send her my crazy interpretations. Oh, I've seen so those. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've been the benefactor, the beneficiary yeah. of, uh, yeah. And I think you've probably heard Rachel when she's talked around when she's been in Toronto. She lives in Jerusalem, but she's sometimes invited to speak in Toronto. Yeah, I'm sure I've heard her. Uh, but she's so different than you are. Yeah, very yeah. different. And uh, but you know, she's a orthodox, and she's a, f a feminist orthodox, um, and has her own interesting interpretations. And uh, so I'm very engaged in the text, but not as engaged as she is, of course, who makes a profession of it. So how do you deal with text? Do you are you willing to just write it off as a allegory, tall tale, or? national document, but do you feel there's a divinity attached to it? Well, it depends what you mean by divinity always. Uh, that, it, that this text has got spirit is no question to me. But then lots of texts have spirit. It, I think, has a very rich spirit and a very revealing spirit. And even before my philosophy, for example, when I interpret Hegel, I interpret Hegel as writing the biblical text in a philosophical vein. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. He changes philosophy by beginning to make philosophy historicized. And that's what the biblical text does. It's about becoming, it's about begetting, and uh, you follow the spirit revealing itself. And I think that's what the text does in a very, very powerful way. What does Judaism not mean to you? What does it not do that people would like it to do? What does it not do? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like a lot of religions, I don't think it's unique in this way. Like a lot of religions, it falls into conventional patterns, and people begin to accept the conventions as the religion, and that's when it begins to get dead. At the same time, without the conventions, it wouldn't be Judaism. So you have this tension between the conventions by which you get the traditions carried on, which are totally necessary, and on the other hand, the need always to make those conventions live again in new ways. And how you run that dialectic is part of the tension of life. Um, so that's what I think uh, is the problem with any religion and with Judaism as well, is the conventions can become dead and then you need to give them life again in new ways and for the, the times you face. And that's what I think you as a rabbi do, I'm sure, in your synagogue, as you do precisely that, see that as your task. Absolutely. Am I wrong? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, and you learn to project and also to live with tension and do it with grace, because ultimately, with, without that, you're in pursuit of a question that will never be answered. In the last uh, few seconds we have, Israel, it seems to be, has ratcheted up that tension to its maximum the tension between convention and, you know, just existing. In 30 seconds or less, can you tell me, how, can that be brought to some positive fruition, that tension? It, I think, is being brought to it. Not only can be, but it is. If you look at all the creativity, and I mentioned this to you before, that goes on in Israel, that's precisely what happens. And it happens about religion, and it happens about science. I mean, the great innovations in science, about technology, about ways of living one's life. And I have to stop you there, but thank you very much for uh, yet another revealing interview and for sharing one of your own secrets. I really appreciate that. Howard, it's a pleasure to be with you on television. Pleasure to have you as a co-host. Thank you.